There was a time not long ago when the world teetered on the edge of annihilation every single day. The Cold War turned the globe into a powder keg. Two titanic blocks, NATO and the Warsaw Pact, prepared for a war they hoped would never come. And at the heart of their plans was the nuclear bomb. Throughout the Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union expected that if war broke out in Europe, it wouldn't be slow or limited. It would be rapid and massive, possibly nuclear from the onset. Planners on both sides envisioned enormous tank armies and mechanized divisions pouring through key corridors like the Fulda Gap in West Germany or the North German Plain. But what's often misunderstood is that nuclear weapons weren't simply reserved for desperate last ditch defense. They were meant to be used during the fighting, as part of the fighting. NATO, unable to match the Warsaw Pact's sheer numbers and conventional forces, adopted a strategy of flexible response. This meant integrating tactical nuclear strikes into the earliest stages of the battle, not just to stop a breakthrough, but to shape the battlefield itself, as Soviet forces funneled through checkpoints, mountain passes, bridges, and road networks. NATO intended to fire nuclear weapons directly into these confined areas. The goal wasn't destruction, it was disruption. Vaporize lead units, create radioactive barriers, and force mass confusion, and buy time. And the Soviets had a very similar plan. Their doctrine also envisioned the early and deliberate use of nuclear weapons, not just in retaliation, but as an offensive tool. Soviet planners assumed that NATO would use tactical nukes immediately, and they didn't intend to wait around. Soviet war plans, like Seven Days to the River Rhine, included massive nuclear strikes across West Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands in the first days of the war. These attacks weren't seen as strategic Armageddon. They were calculated attempts to paralyze NATO's response and create corridors for rapid exploitation by advancing Soviet forces. Both sides developed a wide range of tactical nuclear delivery systems, short-range ballistic missiles, nuclear artillery, air-dropped bombs, and even portable nuclear demolition charges to destroy key terrain features. The Americans had systems like Davy Crockett and the Lance Missile. The Soviets fielded counterparts like the Frog 7 and the Scud B. Some warheads had yields as low as 0.0, .0 kilotons, less than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, designed for battlefield use without annihilating everything in a 10 mile radius. This wasn't abstract theory. Military exercises regularly rehearsed these scenarios. US and NATO forces trained to request and fire nuclear rounds within hours of contact. Soviet units were trained to operate in nuclear contaminated environments, with gas masks and radiation gear worn as a matter of routine in both camps. Nuclear war wasn't just possible, it was planned, rehearsed, and woven into the very fabric of military doctrine. The terrifying reality is that once those weapons were used, even in a limited tactical role, there was no guarantee that things would stay contained. The line between battlefield and homeland, between tactical and strategic, could disappear in moments. But for decades, both NATO and the Soviet Union viewed that risk as acceptable, believing that their survival might depend on firing the first nuclear shot. The problem with using nuclear weapons on the battlefield, besides the obvious, is that the nuclear weapons don't just destroy enemy tanks, they render the land uninhabitable. They cause radioactive fallout, they kill civilians, and perhaps most dangerously of all, they escalate. There's a famous phrase from the Cold War, once you use one nuke, you might as well use them all. The fear that any nuclear use, tactical or strategic, would open the floodgates. Once a low yield bomb was dropped on a tank column, what was to stop a retaliatory strike on a city? And then another, and another. The Cold War ended. The Soviet Union collapsed, and almost unnoticed amid the geopolitical shifts, something else quietly began to revolutionize the nature of warfare precision guided munitions. In 1991, during the first Gulf War, the world witnessed a watershed moment in military history. For the first time, television audiences around the globe saw American cruise missiles and laser guided bombs strike targets with surgical accuracy. A single bridge could be destroyed without damaging adjacent homes. Deeply buried command bunkers were eliminated without leveling entire neighborhoods. This marked a profound shift in strategic thinking. The key insight was simple, yet transformative. You don't need a nuclear weapon to stop an army. You just need to know exactly where it is and have the tools to hit it with precision.
Since that moment, precision weapons have evolved at a staggering pace. Satellite navigation systems like GPS, advanced inertial guidance, laser target designators, and real-time intelligence from surveillance drones have dramatically increased the accuracy, flexibility, and lethality of conventional weapons. Modern militaries now possess the ability to destroy specific targets from hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away, often with meter-level accuracy. And they can do so without devastating fallout, mass civilian casualties, or near certain escalation that would follow from the use of nuclear arms. As a result, the entire logic of modern warfare has changed. Today, nations like the United States, Russia, China no longer place nuclear weapons at the center of their battlefield planning. Instead, they focus on network-centric warfare, integrating real-time intelligence, cyber capabilities, electronic warfare, and precision-guided munitions into a seamless system of offense and defense. Where once a 300 tank armored breakthrough might have required a tactical nuclear strike to blunt, the same threat can now be neutralized by a combination of loitering munitions, satellite guided artillery, swarm drones, and long range missile strikes, coordinated across land, sea, air, and space. And this isn't theory, it's already happening. In Ukraine, we've seen the brutal collision of 20th century mass army tactics with 21st century precision warfare. Both Russian and Ukrainian armored advances have been annihilated, not with nuclear weapons, but with advanced weapon systems like the HIMARS or Russia's Iskander platforms. Supply depots, command posts, logistical routes are now routinely targeted with precision based on drone surveillance and satellite intelligence. This is the new face of modern war. Faster, more accurate, and potentially more controllable. The implications are enormous. As precision warfare has matured, nuclear weapons have been pushed further and further into the background. They haven't disappeared, but their role has evolved. What were once frontline tools of deterrence and battlefield planning have become instruments of last resort. Today, in nearly every nuclear armed nation, doctrine reflects this shift. Nuclear weapons are no longer considered viable tools for early or tactical use. Instead, they are retained primarily as strategic deterrents, meant to signal one thing. If national survival is at stake and every other option has failed, only then will a nuclear response be considered. But we must be absolutely clear about what that last resort truly means. A modern thermonuclear weapon is not cleaner, not safer, not more humane than its predecessors. In fact, the opposite is true. The warheads fielded today are hundreds of times more powerful than those dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Their use, even in limited numbers, could kill tens of millions of people in minutes, collapse economies, destroy ecosystems, and trigger a chain reaction of global instability from which humanity might never recover. The continued existence of a nuclear weapon remains a haunting reminder that beneath all our technological progress, diplomacy, and precision, the capacity for total destruction still sits a button press away, and while that button may be buried deeper than before, it has not been dismantled. While precision weapons have made nuclear weapons less practically necessary, they haven't made them irrelevant. In fact, the number of nuclear weapons in the world remains staggeringly high. Over 12,000 warheads exist globally, most held by the United States and Russia. Some nations have even modernized their arsenals with hypersonic delivery systems, new submarine launched platforms, and tactical warheads that blur the line between battlefield and strategic use. The nightmare of tactical nuclear warfare is still possible. What happens if one side losing a conventional war decides to use a small nuke? Would the other retaliate with a big one? What if command and control systems are jammed or misread? What if escalation spins out of control? Our advancements in precision weaponry have made war more surgical, more targeted, and that has made the use of nuclear weapons less likely, at least in theory. But it has not made the world more safe. The threat of nuclear war still looms. It's no longer front and center in military planning, but it's always in the background, waiting, watching, ready to be summoned in the gravest of moments. Nations hope that by reducing their reliance on these weapons, they reduce the likelihood of their use. But technology alone won't save us. It's up to humanity 
its leaders, its voters, its diplomats, to ensure that the world never walks down that path again. In a way, precision weapons have created a new kind of deterrence, not one based on the threat of mutual annihilation, but on capability, intelligence, and accuracy. We've replaced the blunt hammer with a scalpel, and that has made the battlefield less indiscriminate and perhaps a little less deadly, at least for civilians, compared to the past. But as long as nuclear weapons exist anywhere in any number, we are still living under their shadow.